Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Seth Spencer, and I'm the Teach Climate Network Coordinator for Climate Generation, uh, who is the host of the workshop. And I'm coming to you today from Apple Valley, Minnesota, uh, which is the traditional and contemporary home of the Dakota and Anishinaabe people. Climate generation does begin every uh, workshop that we do with a land acknowledgement. Um, and we take time to acknowledge the native land we're on because one of the uh, effects of genocide and colonization is that it can be easy to forget that we are still occupying land and that indigenous individuals and communities are still alive and leading climate change in this world. We also recognize the tremendous resilience and innovative climate, climate solutions that are created by these communities. We seek to raise up their voices in climate change education. We are proud of the incredible diversity of our country, and we know that our vision for an equitable future will only be achieved when people work together, bridging experiences and expertise from across the globe. Uh, climate Generation's vision is to ignite and sustain the ability of educators youth and communities to act on the systems that perpetuate the climate crisis. We believe we'll accomplish these, uh, this through three overarching strategies that you can see here, um, which is overcoming disinformation, centering anti-racism and systemic equity and personalizing and localizing climate change action. And now I am delighted to introduce our amazing presenter tonight, uh, Kathy Techman with the University of Wisconsin Extension Program. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and stop my screen sharing and turn it over to Kathy. Bonjour, Ndenui Magani Duke. Ndenojiba, Indigenous Cause Kat Techman, Kathy Techman, Ndenojiba, Iron County, Wisconsin, and the homeland of the Lake Superior Ojibwe people. And I gave you a greeting um, that I've been taught. I'm practicing my Ojibwe Moan or Ojibwe language. I said, hello, everybody. Hello, all my relatives. My name is Kathy or Kat Techman. I live in Iron County, Wisconsin, in the homeland of the Lake Superior Ojibwe. And I work as, a, as an environmental outreach state specialist with the University of Wisconsin Madison Division of Extension. So thank you all for being here this evening. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. And of course, that's not up there right now. So I'm I don't know why this always happens when you want to share something, a presentation, it kind of disappears on you. Don't we'll get that up right away. Okay. All right, now let me go back to this. There we go. All right, I'm gonna get rid of these controls. And all righty. How does that look, Seth? Can you all see that okay? All right, great. So um, I'm very excited to be here this evening with you and thank you again for coming at five o'clock. I know it's, it's, a, it's gonna be a challenging time after work. So I've been asked to share um, a presentation on weaving culture and science together for climate action. And I hope it's not presumptuous to say that this is actually maybe um, a step towards decolonizing our climate change education. And we're going to be using a model that has been given the Ojibwe name, Ginkanu Wiziwe Anji Waban, which means guiding for tomorrow in Ojibwe Mo in the Ojibwe language. We call it GWAL to keep it short. So what I'm going to share with you comes from the heart of the Lake Superior Ojibwe Indian country. And it was developed with uh, many, many tribal partners and non-tribal partners. But I'd like to stress that it's applicable in other locations and cultures, which I hope to show and demonstrate to you tonight. So here's a few of the partners that have made this project possible. I say Chimi Gwich, a big thank you to all of them. So when we think about science and we think about knowledge of climate change, whose knowledge are we speaking of? Let's kind of think about that for a second. What, what knowledge do we use to evaluate and think about climate change? Well, one source of knowledge that we tend to be very familiar with is scientific ecological knowledge or SEK. It's kind of that Western science. I don't know where we get that name from, academic science. Sometimes we just presumptuously just call it science and not recognize that there's other ways of knowing. And this is quantitative evidence based on measured or projected changes in climate variables, such as temperature, precipitation, or drought. It's many times it's expressed statistically, sometimes in um, charts like this or diagrams, which many people, including our students, their eyes kind of glaze over looking at. 
Um, some of you might be nodding. And this is the way that we've typically taught climate about climate science, right? Or climate change is using SEK type knowledge. What other knowledges might we have? Um, oh, before I go on to that, I forgot this slide. So SEK also comes with some map formats, but it's still really big data. I think it's kind of linear in my opinion and therefore really kind of incomplete. And our SEK comes in historic evidence already in the books, historic change of temperature and things like that, and also climate projections. Most of you are very familiar with this already, so I won't go into any more detail. All right, but what other kind of knowledges do we have? Well, another one is place-based or local ecological knowledge. This is qualitative evidence based on observations that were seen in changes in climate variables in habitats or beings. Now I'm gonna to refer to species as beings. Uh, oftentimes we call them species, but in, in traditional um, indigenous perspectives, they are beings and relatives. So I'm gonna try my best to use the word beings and relatives in respect to them as having agency of their own. So place-based knowledge of, of change. Um, the, the disastrous floods we had here in the Lake Superior region in 2016 and 2018, uh, lack of snow that we're seeing, um, algae blooms on Lake Superior in the lakes. These are all place-based observations of change. Think about any changes that you're seeing, what you might see, and maybe you could throw some in the chat if you'd like, place-based evidence of change that you're observing in the cultures and locations where you, where you live. And Seth, maybe I'll let you read off a couple so I don't have to try to go to the chat and manipulate that and lose where I am. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, so yeah, I've got wildfire smoke, mm. um, more frequent intense wildfire smoke. Yeah, I know the Pacific Northwest is dealing with that right now. Uh, California always seems to be dealing with it. Um, uh, here in Minnesota, where I live, uh, bird migrations uh, definitely seem to be off historically. Uh, longer summers, lack of sea ice up in Alaska um, and around the world, uh, stronger coastal storms, that huge one that hit the um, Seward Peninsula and Western uh, Alaska only a few weeks ago, earlier ice outdates, more rain in winter. Yeah. So, oh, those are all really good ones. So that's that local place-based knowledge that we have, that we all have. So we, there's actually some good research from Columbia University that local place-based evidence of climate change gained through experiential learning is as effective or more effective than simply studying that SEK, that analytical climate data to increasing climate literacy. So we've got some good um, research on the importance of place-based evidence. And I'll let you, that's one of my favorite little cartoons there. I'll let you take a look at that. <laughs> the guy with his head buried in the sand and realizing uh, climate change. But we have some problems with, place-based evidence. And that's the short-term observations in many of our cultures that have not been on the land very long may not really be reliable indicators of climate change because it could be weather. So some of you may remember Senator Inouye, I don't want to pick on Senator Inouye, taking the snowball into the Senate uh, in February and saying, see, is it it's, can't really be climate change because we still have winter and we still have plenty of snow. But we have research again out of Canada that looked at perceptions of climate change from a local Anglo community and found that what people were thinking was climate change was actually weather variability. So again, our short-term observations, just like weather is different than climate, weather is short-term variations in temperature, you know, it's cold outside today, it's windy, I'm putting on a coat, versus climate change, long-term, um, long-term evidence of changing weather patterns of changing temperature. The same is true of the short-term observations, short-term qualitative observations can actually be weather. But how could we get longer-term qualitative information or data? What might be a source of that? If, while you're pondering that, I always get this question, what about those pesky polar vortexes when we're talking about place-based evidence of climate change? Aren't they evidence that climate change isn't really happening? And I throw this slide up there because this question usually comes up when we have Q&A sessions. So I thought I'd nip it right in the bud and get to polar vortexes. So if you take a look at this little chart that I've been keeping track of since about 2016, you can see the Midwest has had some polar vortexes or polar vortex I or whatever the plural is. But globally, we continue to be either the hottest, second hottest, warmest, tied for the hottest through these years. And if we look at CO2 levels, and we know the, the relationship of CO2 as a blanket kind of around our earth, keeping us warmer, we're seeing CO2 levels continue to rise. 
So again, polar vortexes, weather variability, or are they true indicators of climate change? So let's go back to other sources of knowledge. We are lucky that we have another source of knowledge, a third strand that we can weave together with SEK and place-based evidence of climate change, and that's traditional ecological knowledge, or TEK. There's a number of different words that are used, indigenous knowledge, native science, indigenous science, tribal ecological knowledge. Some people don't like the word traditional because it implies that it's in the past, but actually this is living knowledge. It's long-term place-based evidence of climate change embedded in culture and language. And the changes that are being observed today by, that are by being observed today by indigenous people are based on generations of rela their relationships with beings and habitats who support their cultural life ways and subsistence uh, and cultural practices. So long-term place-based evidence in TEK. So as we think about TEK and we talk about culture, let's just digress a second and think about what is culture. So here's some definitions from some of our more Western sources of, of, um, of, of defining things. So in Google, what, what are you noticing in all of these definitions? And, and maybe you can throw it in the chat and Seth, if you can maybe monitor that and see what people are coming up with. There's a word that's coming up constantly through Google, Webster, Wikipedia. What is culture? So if we're speaking about culture and climate change, we kind of need to know what culture means too, right? All right. Collective knowledge, knowledge, human knowledge. Yeah, I think you're on the right track. Human, human individuals, human, human, human knowledge, culture. Well, let's just see what the definition is in terms of um, culture from the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission. Now I need to let you know who the Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission is. Uh, Glyphwick, as its name is shortened to be, Glyphwick, um, is a group of, is an organization that represents off-reservation treaty rights um, for the 11 Ojibwe tribes in the Lake Superior region. So they are integrally connected with these tribes and cultural knowledge. And culture there is defined as relationships not human, but knowledge based on relationships with the environment and its beings. So you see the little change there? Not human centric, centric but more relationship centric with environment and beings. So kind of keep this in mind as we go through the rest of the presentation. I think you'll see how this really helps to shape this different way of thinking about climate change and how we communicate and teach it to others. So because TEK is based on that long-term continued relationship with the environment and the beings, it provides a baseline for evaluating place-based evidence of climate change that we are seeing in our cultures beyond weather variability. Does that make sense? It gives us a baseline for evaluating what we're seeing, and it really helps us decolonize our typically SEK-based climate science. So for example, Manuman wild rice harvesting that was done, this picture's from the ninth, around the 1900s, is the same, is done almost in the same way as it's done today in the same places. So Ojibwe people that are, have this relationship with the being of Manuman wild rice has, have long-term evidence of how climate change is affecting this being, the sustainability of this being and the cultural practices that, re, that rely on it. So where do we find sources of traditional ecological knowledge? Well, we're lucky um, because the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission has actually publishing research on this. This is their first, this booklet that you see is their first uh, climate vulnerability assessment that integrates SEK and traditional ecological knowledge of the Ojibwe people and presents it both in narrative form, but also in chart form, as you see on my slide. This comes from knowledge, from knowledge keepers, elders, and language speakers. But you also probably have these folks in your community too. They may be indigenous, um, knowledge keepers and speakers and elders, or it may be elders that are in the community in your community that have long term place based evidence of change. But it's particularly um, uh, good if you can find it to use indigenous sources because of that long term relationship uh, with the land and the environment and beings. Lifwick is coming out with its second vulnerability assessment. It should be done next week. So I put down the link where you can actually access this information and use it. And even if you're not in an Ojibwe community, uh, perhaps you can ask indigenous uh, elders in your community to help 
provide some knowledge, or you could use this as, again, kind of a baseline for evaluating climate change um, in your culture and community. So I'm going to digress a little bit here, and we're going to kind of get into the nuts and bolts of how this works. But before we do, I wanted to share a different perspective, too, on, on, on the orders of creation according to the Ojibwe people, as I understand. So the first world that was created was the physical world. The physical world, including um, the earth, Nibi water, uh, physical climate variables, temperature, precipitation, snow, things like that. The first world that was created. All the other worlds depend on the physical world. The next world that was created was the plant world, okay? All of the different plants that we have. And the plant world is dependent on the physical world, of those habitats for it to thrive and survive. The next world is the animal beings, the animal world, and finally the human world. And we are the most to be pitied because we rely on all three of the other worlds. And why is this important? Because it helps inform the model that I'm going to share with you. So changes in climate variables, when you think the physical world, affect habitat conditions that beings, the plant and animal worlds depend on to thrive and survive. Make sense? And those, temp those climate variables include temperature, precipitation, drought, extreme storms, um, changes that we can observe through place-based evidence that we can measure through SEK, and also that we can use long-term TEK to evaluate. And we, the human world, because we are the most dependent on the other worlds, depend on the sustainability of these habitats, the physical world, and the plant and animal beings for supporting activities, many of the activities that we value, whether those activities are cultural, economic, recreational, and I'm going to share some examples. So this is kind of the heart of how this, this GWA model works. All right, so we can weave these three ways of knowing together by integrating them, evidence of them, of how climate change is affecting the sustainability of beings and their habitats who support activities we value. Raising awareness first and understanding with the goal of building climate awareness to action. Some of you who have read Robin Kimmerer's Braiding Sweetgrass, Robin speaks of this braiding together of this knowledge, not necessarily for climate change, but the same way that we weave these knowledges together. Okay, so let's get into how the model works. And I'm gonna use a schematic um, and then we're gonna practice with some actual examples. Okay, so the model starts with an activity that a person values. You value, or maybe it's the students that you're speaking with value. I'm gonna say that you value. And why do, we, why do we start with something that we value personally? Isn't that a little presumptuous? It's because for many people, if we don't talk about something that they value, the message does not stick. This is part of the problem with the polar bear um, argument of climate change. Not that polar bears aren't being affected by climate change, they certainly are. But for many audiences, the polar bears are out of sight and out of mind. Um, and it, climate change does not resonate with the person that the message is being given to. But if you can bring climate change home to people's backyards or homes um, through something that they value, that message will stick and they'll be more likely to take action. So thinking about something, an activity that you value, then think about if there is a being, plant or animal being, or a habitat condition that is needed to support that activity that you value. Okay, then let's talk about evidence that we might see of climate change. Is this activity being or habitat, um, the needs that it has changing based on TEK evidence? How is the activity being or habitat uh, and the habitat it needs changing based on place-based evidence that you're observing. And finally, we can weave in that SEK. How are climate variables, that physical world that's critical to supporting those habitat conditions and beings projected to change based on SEK evidence? We weave together the three ways of knowing. And you might say, huh, I'm not too sure how this is gonna work, but I think it'll become clear in just a second. So this model we have found makes climate change relative to what a person values, it's a cross-cultural way to teach as well as communicate about climate change, and it's adaptable to different cultures and locations. It's very flexible. So let's get into some examples. I'm gonna start with an example that's um, an example from Ojibwe country, and that's the activity of wild rice harvesting. So the being and habitat that wild rice harvesting is dependent on, of course, is wild rice, manumen, meaning the good berry. And this being requires shallow water, 
moderate water level changes and a cool growing season. It's an aquatic grass. What evidence of change do we see? We see place-based evidence here in the Lake Superior region of increased flooding of wild rice beds. We take a look at the climate vulnerability assessment from the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission, and we see that their research based on TEK shows that Manuman is highly vulnerable to climate change. And what does SEK say may be happening to those climate variables that will affect the habitat that Manuman needs to thrive and survive? and then Manuman and ultimately the activity of wild rice harvesting, we see projected change in the number of heavy precipitation days, especially in the Midwest here. So increased chance of flooding of wild rice beds. So do these three lines of evidence agree, the culture and science agree that climate change is affecting Manuman, the sustainability of Manuman, and therefore this activity that is so valued? I think you would agree it is. Or if we didn't wanna take a look at flooding, we could take a look at brown spot disease, which is affecting Manuman now, which is exacerbated by warm temperatures, high humidity and warm temperatures. And we can take another example of SEK of average summer temperatures increasing significantly in Minnesota and Wisconsin across the Great Lakes, which will affect Manuman. So this is an example of how the model works. I'm gonna run through a couple more examples now, just to give you an idea of how flexible this model is. Some of the activities you may, it may resonate with ones that you value as well. So here's one. This activity is walleye fishing, or I could also have put up treaty walleye um, fish harvesting, spear fishing, which the Ojibwa uh, bans uh, a cultural activity that's practiced in the, in the Great Lakes states here in Wisconsin. So the being and habitat that uh, walleye fishing is, relies on, of course, is Oga, the walleye who requires cool water habitats. So place-based evidence of change. And the only way I could really show this was this, uh, this chart here that shows increased numbers of bass, a being that can tolerate warmer lake conditions and decreases of walleye shown in green in Wisconsin Lake based on place-based evidence. If we take a look at TEK evidence, we see that Olga from TEK evidence is moderately vulnerable just pushing the line to being highly vulnerable. This is a being that's highly regarded culturally by the Ojibwa people for, for subsistence. And then if we take a look at SEK, we see that summer temperatures are increasing again significantly by mid-century, up to four to six degrees in our area. So what will this mean for the sustainability of Oga or the walleye and the activity of walleye fishing? And we actually have research that shows many of our Wisconsin lakes will be converting to bass lakes. Does this, how does this affect the Ojibwe people? Maybe our resorts that rely on walleye fishing or just people that like to eat walleye. Again, it's a way of communicating and bringing climate change home to people's backyards to things that they value. Here's another one, summer swimming. Of course, warmer water that we're seeing in our Wisconsin and Midwest lakes might be really nice for summer swimming, but also it exacerbates um, some of some issues in our lakes, and some of them are non-local beings such as Eurasian water milfoil, which is an invasive species which we culturally call a non-local being. Okay, non-local. Invasive is, is kind of a harsh, disrespectful term. But this non-local being can tolerate a wide range of temperatures, including warmer water and low oxygen. What place-based evidence do we see of change? Well, I don't know what you're seeing on your lakes in Minnesota, but here in Northern Wisconsin, we're seeing weed harvesters in lakes where we've never seen any, anything like this before. Here we do not have any TEK knowledge because uh, the non-local beans have not yet been evaluated for TE, by TEK specialists. But again, we use that same summer temperature map of increasing temperatures that will warm our waters. Maybe nice for swimming, but it's also going to exacerbate issues with non-local beings. Another activity, watching loons. Again, isn't the loon the state animal for Minnesota, if I'm not mistaken? Yes, okay, so we all love loons, right? Again, requiring shoreline nesting habitats with stable to moderate water level fluctuations. So warmer temperatures increase black fly predation on chicks and cause nest abandonment. What are we seeing? Evidence of change. We're seeing a lot more black fly predation on eggs and a nest abandonment. If we take a look at TEK evidence here by Glyphwick, we see the common loon, Mung is the common loon's name, highly vulnerable to climate change. 
I'm going to use that good old map that we've been seeing in the last couple of slides, average summer temperatures by mid-century, we're going to be warming, which is going to exacerbate black fly predation and nest abandonment. So it looks, uh, Audubon Society is actually saying it looks all but certain that Minnesota will lose its iconic loons by the end of the century. Um, is this something that would make climate change come alive to people uh, that you might be speaking to or get them thinking or open their mind about climate change? Another activity many of you are involved in is hiking with kids in the woods. And we have the being the Minnesota state bird and it's also the Wisconsin state bird, mosquitoes requiring water, uh, uh, water for breeding, warmer temperatures. We have evidence. Are you seeing more mosquitoes in your areas where you live and work? We are where I am in northern Wisconsin. And again, we don't have any TEK evidence on this being yet. But if we take a look at average annual temperatures by mid-century, again, we're warming. So warming temperatures are going to support new species. In fact, we're beginning to see West Island Zika viruses increasing here in Wisconsin. You probably are too in Minnesota. And heavier precipitation events that we could be that we will be seeing may actually, it, it, the future is unclear. It will provide more habitat for the mosquitoes, but could also wash away some, some mosquitoes and some breeding areas. So the future is unclear, but we are seeing more mosquitoes and the, uh, the increase of diseases that they bring. All right, I'm gonna let you try one. Here is an activity that many of you might be involved in, running, okay? So you're gonna to have to use your thinking caps now and your artistic ability as educators. What habitat do you need for running? Maybe you can just put it in the chat to see what kind of ideas you come up. What habitat? Uh, trails. Um roads, trails, good air quality, dry roads, not too hot. Okay, let's stop there with not too hot. That's the one that I picked. Ideal temperatures between about 44 degrees to 59. I know we've all run marathons when it's been a lot hotter, but we're seeing evidence of a lot more heat stress, both in our urban areas and also for some of our events. I use a little bit different map here. This happens to be a Wisconsin map, a projected change by mid-century. Um, this would be a middle of the road climate scenario. We don't reduce or we don't increase our carbon emissions over today. And you can see we're gonna be warming significantly with days above 90 degrees, which will probably affect our summer recreation and athletic events, an activity that many people like to do running. Okay, another way of making climate change come alive. I wanna share uh, a couple more slides and I've gotta watch my time here. Here's another activity that's coming up very soon, a big activity in our area, and this is hunting deer. The habitat and bean is Wawash Geishi, the white-tailed deer, highly adaptable to a variety of habitats. Warmer winters reduce energy loss and stress. Are we seeing more white-tailed deer on the landscape? Yes, I see some nods, yes. If we take a look at TEK evidence, Wawash Geishi here, according to TEK specialists, is less vulnerable to climate change. And if we, does SEK agree that what's going to be happening to the climate variables, how will that affect the habitat for Wawash Geishi and the sustainability of this bean? If we take a look at the SEK evidence here, in this map, we see number of days below 20 degrees by mid-century will be decreasing significantly, up to 20 days fewer in some areas. This means less winter stress on Wawash Geishi, more survivability in the wintertime, and probably more deer. There may be some limiting factors, however, and some of you can think of some. CWD and perhaps tick infestations, right? Especially some of those can be exacerbated by climate change as well. But here is a being that may not need to be moving on due to climate change and climate change may actually favor. Another being, so we're gonna change up here and we're gonna get out of an activity. We're just gonna look at a being and evidence of change. And this is Waboos, the snowshoe hare, requires snowy habitats for winter camouflage. Waboos does what the creator made Waboos to do is change white based on photosensitivity uh, during the winter time. But as we have warming temperatures, we no longer have as much snow. And poor little Waboos here, uh, against a, a, a non-snowy background, sticks out like a sore thumb and is subject to predation. So if we take a look at Waboos, and traditional knowledge keepers tell us that extremely vulnerable to climate change because of this. 
If we take a look at nights below 32 that are projected in our region for um, producing snow, we need 32 degrees or lower to produce snow, right? What, what does this tell us about the sustainability of Waboos? And what is Waboos teaching us about other beans and activities that rely on cold and snow? And I'm gonna just run through these quickly. One of them is winter logging, which is an activity that is uh, very important for many of our Northern areas because log trucks are able to get into some of the soft woodland areas when, the frozen when they have frozen roads, which of course need temperatures below 32, just like Waboos appreciates when snow falls. But we're seeing evidence if we talk to loggers of equipment breaking through on frozen ground, up to six weeks of loss of winter logging in some areas. Um, this is oral, um, oral histories that have been shared with us. And again, those nights below 32 are decreasing. So fewer cold nights mean less frozen ground and less money in pocketbooks. If you're a skier or snowboarder, that habitat that you need, snow, also requires temperatures below 32. Think about skiing or snowboarding if you are a skier or snowboarding. What evidence have you seen of change at your local ski hills? in terms of the need for snowmaking by ski hills or just a lack of snow or even opening uh, by ski areas. Again, we're showing projections of changes in nights below 32, much fewer. How will that affect this winter recreation or snowmobiling? Again, evidence of many of our snowmobile trails aren't even opening in the winter anymore because of this. So this is a way of raising awareness about climate change. So think about how climate change is affecting the beings and habitats and life ways that you value and your community relies on. And you can use this GWAL model. I've provided a template that I'm going to show next. I've provided this template to Seth that he can share with everybody so you can kind of work through this whole thing. And if you don't remember anything that I shared with you so far, we have a website that might be helpful. It's www.g-wow.org. It has four seasonal Ojibwe Lifeway units. It has an investigate the science, a section on creating climate change projects and a place to share them out. The most important tab here is resources, which will tell, give you again, an overview of how this model works and how you can apply it within your culture and location. So does it work to integrate TEK and place-based and SEK knowledges? Is that effective in teaching and communicating about climate change? We have two sources of evaluation. One is from a master's, um, UMD master's degree thesis by Patty Carpenter that found that it did increase personal literacy, confidence in teaching about climate change, and that the model was transferable despite location and cultures. We have a second evaluation that comes from Climate Strong Institute educators from 2019. And you can see the evidence there that incorporating place-based evidence um, and this way of teaching about climate change increases confidence and is also likely for educators to help others adapt climate resiliency behaviors. Before we go to question and answer, and I know I'm getting close on time here, I just wanna share uh, another website that you might wanna take a look at. This is an example of decolonizing climate education. Uh, it is the Minasan website. I do wanna make note that when you go to the Minasan website, the hotspot map that is in the center of the website is being updated right now. So you will not be able to touch on one of the hotspots and go to one of the island locations to learn about an ecosystem but please know that you can use the ecosystem tab to access the entire curriculum. I apologize for that. We just happen to have some maintenance going on with Google Maps right now. So Minasan tells stories of how climate change is affecting 12 ecosystems found within the Apostle Islands, Winneboju Minasaning, based on Ojibwe cultural knowledge. And SEK is added to provide a cross-cultural perspective. The climate action, which is included, uh, is based on respect, reciprocity, relationship, and, and responsibility, and Ojibwe Moan, the Ojibwe language, is infused throughout. You can explore that. This is one of what one of the ecosystem sections look like. There are four. You can see the four orders of creation. It is organized by that, the stories. These are stories of how in each of the four orders of creation within that, within that ecosystem are connected by and affected by climate change. Remember those four orders that we talked about earlier? And there's finally then a section called consider this, which is added to provide different perspectives. 
including examples of um, where SEK and TEK may not necessarily agree. The example that I'm giving here is where one of the ecosystems that was considered having low vulnerability to climate change based on scientific ecological perspectives was actually considered highly vulnerable to climate change due to important beings based on indigenous perspectives. And I think I'm just gonna quickly just talk about climate adaptation and, and thinking about different ways that we take action and doing that through respecting the personhood of all beings as, and as relatives, not as resources kind of puts a different spin on how we think about adaptation, allowing space for building respectful relationships and learning from those beings, of making it our responsibility to change and not that of beings to change. And then finally, encouraging community adjustments while re retaining reciprocity and balance while moving towards adaptation. So what is climate change teaching us? I'm gonna just throw something in the chat real quick. What is climate change teaching us? And this picture shows this. Anything from uh, the chat? Yeah, we need community to adapt. Uh, relationships are important and we depend on each other. Uh, more respect for beings, cooperation is required interconnectedness, we're all connected to each other, interconnectedness again. Yep, you hit the nail right on the head. Climate change is teaching us that we're all connected, that, it, that we're all connected, we're all in this together. So I always like to end my presentations with this quote from Joe Rose Iban, who has walked on or has passed on. So we use the respectful suffix Iban at, at, with his last name, a Bad River tribal elder who gave us this quote. And the Ojibwe believe that we must think seven generations ahead while making decisions today. All cultures share responsibility for protecting our home, the earth. We cannot eliminate all the risks that climate change presents, but we can make a difference in slowing its impacts. The culture and life ways of future generations will be affected by the choices that we make. I think a pretty for profound way to think about climate change. So I'd say chi miigwech to everyone. Um, I'm going to actually go back to one of the slides that I skipped over quickly because I just want to give you this uh, resource. Uh, we won't go over it. We just don't have enough time. But this is a, a resource by the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission, a tribal climate adaptation menu. I'd highly recommend that you uh, download a PDF of this and read through at least the first part of this menu. It uh, it's provides some very interesting perspectives on climate adaptation from an indigenous perspective. Then the menu gives some, the, some steps that you can take as a land manager or you can adapt as an educator to taking action. And I'm gonna stop my share here and say miigwech to, and see if there's any questions that I can answer. Yeah, thank you so much, Kathy. And uh, before I open it up, or we open it up truly to questions and answer for the rest of the time, I'm gonna just jump in and share um, just a few more slides uh, just about this workshop series. Um, and then we'll come back to, to Q&A and we'll wrap up from there. But um, yeah, Kathy joined us as part of the, the Teach Climate Network workshop series. And so um, these professional development opportunities that there will be nine of them throughout the year, uh, it's just part of what we're able to offer around climate change, education, professional development. We also um, do monthly newsletters with resources, tips, strategies, um, uh, which all culminates in our annual Summer Institute for Climate Change Education. Um, and then uh, just to let you know, we will be having our next workshop uh, here in just a few weeks. Um, where Climate Generations Program Director Kristen Poppleton will be talking about the upcoming Conference of the Parties, COP27 in Sharm el-Sheikh, Egypt, uh, and really trying to kind of explain like what the heck are these huge United Nations gatherings and how can educators connect to, to what's going on. Uh, and then um, Climate Generation also, of course, has resources and curriculums, uh, and we just have a brand new uh, Becoming a Climate Change Educator, 
Um, so really great resources. Uh, and as you saw, I will be sending out um, recording, slide deck, all of the resources here in just a, a couple of days in a follow-up email. Um, but that's where I'll wrap up and come back to some time for questions to, to Kathy. Thanks, everybody. Well, I appreciate everyone. We went through that pretty quickly. <laughs> so if there's any questions, please, or I put my uh, email address in the chat. You know, if you think of something just, or I can be of service, let me know. Um, So let me ask all of you a question. What do you think about this model, the GUA model? Do you think that you would be able to use it, uh, adapt it to um, your students or a culture and location that you that you teach in? Maybe you could share how you might. Hi, Kat. Uh, my name's Carly. I live in Spokane, Washington. Um, and I'm thinking about how I might share this model, both with um, teachers who participate in professional development with us. So how can I share this model um, as a way for them to think about incorporating indigenous ways of knowing into how they teach climate change, but then thinking about how we could bring this model directly to students and ask them to identify things that they like to do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because sometimes it's a lot more powerful for them to come up with the phenomenon than it would be for us or for a teacher. And so what would it look like to ask students to identify an activity they care about? And then how could we support their research and their process to understand all those different forms of evidence? Um, that can be a big lift, asking young people to do all those different kinds of um, research. And so what supports would they need and how could I find them and give them to them so that they could do those different evidence gathering processes themselves um, and maybe walk them through the process rather than walking them through it myself, you know? Yep, you're right. You're right. That's perfect. That's exactly how it should be working. And in fact, the GWAL model, the website may give you some ideas of how to do that. But we, uh, we've actually had a, a, a charter school of 110 students. Um, they do a climate expedition multidisciplinary through the year. And they use the GWAL model for each student came up with an activity or cultural uh, life way that they were interested in. And believe me, it ranged everything from skiing to raising pigs. And they, <laughs> which was great because it needs to resonate with what the person values. That's why I wanted to start with that value piece. Um, and then the students looked at what they were observing, whether using phenology studies, whether it was observation on the farm, um, what they were observing was happening. And then they talked with elders if there was a way of integrating traditional knowledge that could either provide a baseline or be brought over or correlate to what they were, they that was woven in. And then we use climate maps from that I, as I showed you, or we also have in Wisconsin, the Wisconsin Initiative on Climate Change Impacts, climate change um, in mapping format, either historical data or midterm, um, near-term, mid-century projections. And there's so many teachable moments in all of these elements, but again, then getting the students to look at those lines of evidence and weave them together and see if there's, if, as we say, culture and science agree, if the sciences, the knowledges agree, that climate change is actually affecting this activity, and then what are you going to do about it? And then coming up with that action plan. So you're right on the money with that. I appreciate that question. Thank you. And Kathy, I'm not sure if you can now see the chat, but there were a couple of responses that, yes, uh, folks could definitely see it. It's clear. It gets right to the point. Great. Okay, good. I'm so glad to hear that. And please check out that, that tribal adaptation menu, that new resource from Glyphwick. Uh, again, it was developed for land managers, but there is just a, a richness in the, um, in, the, in the document of providing indigenous perspectives on climate change that actually some may be a little bit controversial. Uh, for example, waiting for systems to balance out rather than taking a knee jerk reaction on climate change. Um, so it's a little provocative, but it does get us thinking about climate change in a different way and respect for those beings as relatives. Um, and, and I, I just encourage you to, to download that publication and, and as well as the climate vulnerability assessments.
any suggestions that you have that we could improve this presentation? Um, I think it would be great if you could include um, use cases, like if you could do some slides on the charter school that does the project sure. um, or bring in some examples from classrooms that teachers have done and like student artifacts of what they come up with. Because um, it's always really good to talk about models and frameworks and how you can do it, but seeing um, what people have actually done and what's come out of it can always be like good food for thought. Oh, that's great. And I do actually have pictures of all of that. Um, 110 kids doing phonology wheels, GWO um, videos. Every student had to do a poster uh, phonology wheel that integrated SEK, TEK, um, and each student had to do a video. And there were 110 of them. Um, yeah. So I have, <laughs> thank you for that. I have pictures of that. In fact, if that would be helpful, I would be happy to, to send you some of those artifacts if you would like. If you. Yeah. I think seeing some of the posters would be really great because that's yeah. like, you know, students, especially in Spokane, don't always have access to technology, but like a poster is something they could do even if they didn't have like video recording equipment. Mm -hmm. Seth, if I if I sent some of those to you, would you be able to share them? Okay, yep. let's yep. We'll do so that. anybody that's, that yep. is registered, I can share out the this recording, the slide deck, and of course those those resources. And we're definitely okay. getting some agreements that that would be wonderful to share. Um, I also got see a, a question of if you have any educators that have used this that have like an actual lesson plan, um, as there are some formal educators today and they, they always like something ready to go um, to, to possibly see that and then um, some other chat of just uh, wonderful to see for both students and adults uh, see that uh, in action. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And we have used this all the way from elementary through adult education. And we actually run field courses for professional development field courses um, that several of the climate change folks have attended and helped with as well um, for educators during the summertime. So yeah, I'd be happy to share that as well. Yeah, we'll take just a couple more minutes if anybody else has questions. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording, but do again want to thank uh, Kat so much for joining us today. And thank you all for spending the evening uh, learning um, a bit more about the subject. So uh, definitely reach out um, if you have any questions. But yeah, thanks again, everybody. Chibi mm Gwich, -hmm. everyone. That's a big thank you <laughs> for for um, letting me share this with you and and. Uh, and the kind suggestions that you've offered. See you again. Okay. Hi, Kat, do you mind if I ask a, another question that I just thought of? Oh, please. Um, thanks, sorry, I'm, I've been driving most of the time. But, um, I, um, I'm just thinking about when when people go through that process of thinking about you know what is directly affected to me what am I going to miss or what am I going to um, lose or what do I love that's going to be affected by climate change um, how do you what recommendations or suggestions you have for dealing with some of the um, emotions and sense of loss that may um, come up as youth or people of any age go through that process and what are your experiences with, with that I guess. yeah that's a that's a good question in fact our climate leadership team that i that i um, coordinate is actually going to put on a session on on, on anxiety because that is something um we do a we do a um, an activity with students uh in the forest where we actually mark tree beings that will be moving on or are expected to move on and in some cases uh depending on where we are some of the if we're in a boreal type forest we actually flag the trees many of the trees are not gonna be there and students are really distressed about that. Will there be a forest here or not? And yes, there most likely will be, but there will be different beings there. Um, there will be different beings that will be coming. So maybe different, uh, you know, tribes and people are very adaptable. Yes, there is going to be some losses and um, maybe some of these we are able to mitigate and maybe some of these we are not. Um, the adaptation menu has some strategies for that, you know, in providing, um, habitats that might protect some of these vulnerable beings um, that may be moving on, but others we may have just have to face like Waboos, 
um, is that maybe a being that we're not going to see in our northern environs anymore. Um, and yes, that does come with some sadness, um, cultural sadness in that. Um, so I think that is something that that actually makes the climate, um, the realization come to life more and come home more, even though it is a sadness. Um, it, and, and, but in other cases, we're gonna have gains. We're going to have beings that like Wawash Keishi, the white-tailed deer, which will probably be benefited by climate change. We may see more of them. We may see some different beings coming forth. Uh, and mm -hmm. again, that as we have these non-local beings coming in, the relationships, I mean, they're doing what the creator told them to do. That's why we don't call them invasive. I mean, they're doing what they're supposed to do. They just happen to be here because the habitat conditions are correct for them uh, at, because we've made that, we've made them that way. The other thing that's really important to remember too is when we're talking about climate projections, you know, cl climate is changing, but the projections that we have doesn't necessarily mean that we're totally baked into that. We can still help make change and help slow that down. And I think that's a message of hope for our young people that they can be leaders to help slow that down. I mean, some stuff we're, it's kind of baked in the system that, that we are going to be warming, but maybe not to the levels that are being projected right now uh, that we can actually, if we take action uh, and do something, we can, we can make changes. Mm -hmm. So that's not a complete and total answer. Yeah. But it, there is hope that we can, but if we act, but we need to do something. And again, mm -hmm. many people say, oh, it's only gigantic act actions that will make a difference. Any action, any step forward. I, I tell all students, we all have one of these, a mouth. We can respectfully speak to others. We can use a GWA model or other ways of communicating. That is action. Anything to do to move forward. Because once we take that first footfall, we'll take the next one. That old saying, the journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step. And that, that leads to hope too, if we can do something. Um, if we feel that, if all hope is lost, then we're pretty much vapor locked and nothing's going to happen. And it, it'll just exacerbate the situation even more. That makes sense? Yes, very much. Thank you. Appreciate yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. But, and what you're doing is so critically important too, and recognizing that and, and helping students address that and, and adults too, you know, address, address that, that feeling. Because if, yeah. if we get too anxious and we do vapor lock and we lock up inside, then we're not going to be able to make any change. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for your work. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything else that I could try to help with or that you want to share before we go? No, well, th thank you so much again, Kathy, for joining us this evening. Um, yeah, and thanks, uh, Sarah and Rashmi, for joining us tonight. Yes, thank you so much. Mama P, see you, see you around the next yep. time we meet. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. 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 Anything we need to close out with? No, that was wonderful. I really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, and yeah, I'll, I'll keep an eye out for if you have any of those pictures yep. or anything. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'll include you on the, the email that I send out to folks just so you can okay. see. Um, but it's, it will have the recording, the slide deck. Um, and uh, I will ask, you had sent me a slide deck that had just a couple different slides. I'm completely fine sending that one out, but do you, do you want to use that one or do you want to use the one that you shared? Um, did I not send you this one? You sent, I think it's like 90% the same, but you had said that you updated a couple um, slides. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll resend this one to you. Okay. Why don't okay. I do that? Yeah, with the okay. pictures. And I'm going to ask one of the Marathon, it's Marathon Venture Academy, oh, who's yeah. in the Wausau area. I'm going to... Yeah. I'll ask if, if uh, I know a, a couple contacts there, uh, yeah. if they would be okay with teachers yeah. contacting them. Okay. Yeah. Sounds Cause great. they, th what they would do was remarkable. They've done it. Yeah. They're, actually they're coming up next spring. They've oh, done cool. this. They do it every other year. And yeah, yeah 600 parents and teachers came to watch oh, 110 video. Uh, it was amazing. It was absolutely That's amazing. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, well thanks for inviting me. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You thank have a good you. evening. Yeah. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks again. Yep.